Franklin Roosevelt mm -hmm. was uh, proud <coughs> of being called a traitor to his class. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm mm -hmm. interested if you think about your own career, your time as Secretary General, when you came in, uh, there were two principal groups mm -hmm. that were uh, your supporters. Uh, one was, uh, of course, your own continent of Africa, mm -hmm. and the other was the United States. Mm -hmm. As we think back on it, and, and we've, we've talked about this before, you and I, you soon did two things. Uh, one, you challenged African leaders. Uh, on a couple of fundamental issues. Sure. Uh, one was human rights, yeah. and one was uh, military coups d'etat. Mm -hmm. And you went to Harare and spoke about human rights and African rights, and you led a change in the practice uh, of African governments in not recognizing new governments that had seized power uh, through uh, military coups. The United States, similarly, mm -hmm. Uh, I think, and was, uh, a very strong supporter of yours mm -hmm. in the beginning and was till the end. That said, you did over time challenge the United States okay. and its various governments during your time in part of the way that it saw its role mm -hmm. in the world, its interpretation mm -hmm. of international law, and its view of multilateralism. I think we'd, we'd all be interested in, in hearing as, a, as an individual, mm -hmm. As a leader, where does that come from, that, that stepping aside and stepping back and saying, going out of where you came from, where your support came from, and challenging these basic assumptions mm -hmm. of much of the support you came from? Yeah. That's a very interesting uh, question. I think um, I came to the job with a clear understanding of what the Charter demanded and what needed to be done by the Secretary General of the United Nations. Yes, I came from Africa and Africa was my base. And the African countries and the Africans were very excited and supportive that I had become Secretary General. But I also had to make it clear and it was clear to me that I was not only a Secretary General for Africa, but I was Secretary General for all regions. It was clear to me that as much as the U.S. supported me, I could not have become a Secretary General without the support of the other countries. And to retain the support of the, those countries and get everyone to work together, I had to be faithful to the principles and ideas which underlie the, organ, uh, the organization. Which meant that there would come moments when I would have to clash with African countries and with the U.S. Uh, it took a while for some countries to understand and accept it, but I was quite uh, intrigued even once uh, George Bush telling me at the White House when we were discussing an issue we had differed on, he said, well, Kofi, I understand you have to do what you have to do and I have to do what I have to do, but you need to be able to stand back and not feel that you are captive of one group or the other. You, whether it's a group of small, weaker states or a powerful state, mm -hmm. it, won't, it won't work. And so that uh, uh, ability to stand back and to know that you will take risks, you'll be knocked, but it comes with the territory. If you try to please everybody, you will not be able to do your job. And so, uh, you, I, I took the decision that I'm going to do what I have to do. I would displease some countries and some powerful countries at times, but they will understand. Mm. Let me ask uh, a related question to this, something that many people who have asked me about, which is that in the job of, of uh, Secretary General, have asked me, i.e., about you, um, in the job of Secretary General, you have to deal with everyone. Yeah. You have to deal with leaders, uh, some of whom you admire, mm -hmm. uh, some of whom you don't mm -hmm. admire, uh, some of whom happen to be war criminals, mm -hmm. uh, but it is in the nature of the job itself. That's correct. And we can think of Saddam Hussein or mm -hmm. Gaddafi or Bashir of Sudan and many others that I'm sure you're happier for mm -hmm. me to mention than you, um, but we can think of many of them. Yeah. When you went into those meetings and situations, 
how did you, in your own mind, uh, balance your own obvious sense of outrage at what they had done um, with the importance of the meeting and the value of having the conversation and what you tried to achieve? And Because lots of people will say, how could you shake hands yeah. with person X, or how could you do that? And I think uh, it's an essential part of the, of the role, yeah. but, but how did you, in your own yeah. mind, reconcile these? Yeah, it, it's always a, a difficult question. Um, I recall when I decided to go and talk to Saddam Hussein in February 2008. I think Jeremy was... 98. 98, January uh, 98. I was leaving the house very early. I said goodbye to Nan and others, and we got, I got out of the house. And to my surprise, it was very early. I was going to take the Concorde, fly to Paris, and I had borrowed President Chirac's plane and continuing on to uh, Baghdad. Journalists asked a couple of questions, and one of them asked a the question, Mr. Secretary General, are you tough enough to take on Saddam Hussein and to, to convince him to open his palaces? And I said, what a silly question. Jumped into the car and left. He used a silly question in his article. But in any case, uh, I was, uh, leaving convinced that even a man like Saddam Hussein could be rich at some level. That first of all, one had to talk to him. I had a secretary general, you have no other means mm. but persuasion yeah. and arguments, arguing, explaining sincerely and getting him to understand. It was a very interesting discussion because I went with a team and we negotiated with the, his ministers, led by Tariq Aziz. And um, it also showed how powerful the man was, Saddam Hussein was. On critical issues, Tariq Aziz would say, this is a question for our leadership, which means we are not touching it and don't push us on it. And I got the message, I said I would take it up with Saddam in the tete a tete. So we came with a, a, a fairly broad agreement, but there were four or five issues which they wouldn't touch. So I had to go into a one-on-one -on -one negotiations with him, an interpreter, mm. and I was determined to try and reach him. The issue was the inspectors were doing their work, and there was a sense that Saddam Hussein was hiding weapons of mass destruction in his palaces. And the US insisted he should open up the palaces for inspection by the UN inspectors, and he wouldn't do it. So the US was ready to go and bomb Iraq. And for me, this was uh, unthinkable or irrational in the sense that if he says he doesn't have weapons, he, you know, despite the insult as he claims or the lack, the lack of respect and dignity, he should open up his palace and spare his people and his nation. And that we should be patient enough to negotiate with him to get him to do it. When we got into the tete-a-tete -tete and started negotiating, he, he was a very interesting man. He's, he's not one of those who uses his hands a lot. He speaks in monotonous voice, very calm, poker face, nothing. And at one point, he said, Mr. Secretary General, you have to excuse me. I must go and pray. And I said, oh gosh, he prays, there is hope. <laughs> so I said to myself, so he left the room, and I turned to the in interpreter and said, am I getting through to him? He said, yes, yes, carry on. <laughs> he was even scared sure. to speak, in, you know. In the end, he did agree to open up the palaces. And the bombing was delayed for 10 months, I think, or eight months. It came in October, towards the end of the year. The bombing did come because other problems uh, arose. But you have to talk to people sometimes to save lives. These are people you may not invite to lunch or even have coffee with. But if by engaging them, you can save lives, stop killing, and, 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 and uh, help people, 
you should do it, and I'll be prepared to do it today and tomorrow. And um, uh, these are not people you can go and bang the table and threaten that I'm coming in with weapons, I'm coming in with armies. And even when you go in with armies, there are consequences. Mm. We saw that we've seen the aftermath of the Iraq war. And so uh, you have to begin by doing everything you can uh, to reach them. Sometimes they may, it, you, it may work, other times it doesn't work, but you have to try. I don't think I could have forgiven myself if I had not tried in, in the Iraqi case. I consider it as one of the sacred duties of a Secretary General mm. to save lives. Mm. Thank you.